Leadership Lessons from Outer Space. Today, I'm here with Terry Wirtz, also known as Astro Terry. He served as an Air Force test pilot, then joined NASA as an astronaut in 2000. During this time with NASA, he piloted the Space Shuttle Endeavour and in 2015 became the commander of the International Space Station. He is also featured in the IMAX film, A Beautiful Planet. Terry also worked with Russian Space Agency cosmonauts during some of the most stressful US-Russian relations since the Cold War. Terry retired from NASA in 2016. Terry and I first met in 2019 in Boston at the Harvard Business School during the Executive General Management Program. Terry is also an author. He just released his new book, How to Astronaut, An Insider's Guide to Leaving Planet Earth. He also just released a new movie, One More Orbit. The movie is about pushing boundaries to its limits and inspiring the next generation. Terry and his team broke the round the world record for any aircraft flying over North and South Poles in a Gulfstream long range business jet. Not many of us get the opportunity to speed around the planet 250 miles up above for over 200 days. So fasten your seat belts for what's going to be an amazing learning experience with Terry. I love Anton's smile. Wow. <laughs> Terry, that was fun. welcome. What can I say? Yeah, it's good to be with you all the way in Australia. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So it's uh, it's a great to see you, Terry, after almost a year since we last met. I know. And, I can't um, believe it. Let's, uh, let's start with the uh, landing that we just saw. Um, tell us what was that about and uh, what were you feeling at that moment? I know there was a special special landing for you. It was. It was the end of a 200-day mission for me and Anton Shkaplerov and Samantha Christopheretti. And uh, that was in a Soyuz, which is a Russian capsule. My first space flight was in a space shuttle. So that was a much more gentle way to come back to Earth. Uh, this, But the Soyuz is kind of like a car crash. I mean, you just crash like you saw, and then it's over with, and then you're back on Earth. So um, it was it was, it was was actually a lot of fun. I really enjoyed the ride back to Earth. Uh, it was definitely Mr. Toad's wild ride. <laughs> One thing, uh, you know, that always fascinated me is uh, what it was feeling like in the first takeoff, because I know, it, I think in one of your documentaries, you talked about like, you know, once you get to the countdown and when the rocket sort of, you know, boosters fly off, you know, there's no point, the point of no return. So tell us like, you know, what, we, what it was like, you know, the first takeoff uh, and what happens there. Yeah, my first launch was on Endeavour, Space Shuttle Endeavour, and I had been a fighter pilot and test pilot. I thought I had done a lot of cool stuff, but man, when those yeah. engines light, um, they run for about six seconds before you actually launch, because like you said, once you launch, once the solid rocket motors, the big white ones light off, you're, you're going somewhere. <laughs> there, there's no stopping, um, and there, there was just so much noise, so much vibration, that this big four million pound massive spaceship accelerates up to 3g so it's kind of like laying on your back and having a couple people lay on top of you and you're shaking the shuttle vibrated a lot because of the solid rocket motor fuel and there's just so many different things that happened and then in how to astronaut my new book there's several chapters about launch because there's a lot of things happening during those few minutes so 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 you launch you get there now i have no idea what happens when you get to the space station uh, do you check in do you kind of carry your bag suitcase what happens? Yeah. So- Luckily, our suitcases were already there. So um, NASA has this rotating series of cargo ships and uh, every few months. So, you know, months before you launch, your stuff's already packed and it's already on the way. And unfortunately, maybe a month, maybe two months before we launched, there was a orbital Cygnus spaceship that blew up in Virginia, launching out of Wallops in Virginia. And of course, half of my clothes were on that. Uh, Samantha's spacewalking gear was on that. It was you know, we lost a lot of stuff, but thankfully NASA doesn't put everything on one ship. So I at least had half my stuff when I got to space. So Terry, uh, you know, part of my passion is to learn from people like you who's done some extraordinary things, you know, 
what can we learn from the lessons that you may have actually gone through in, in outer space? And that's why I kind of, you know, titled this as, you know, leadership lessons from outer space. Tell us a bit about what, what it was like, you know, working with the Russians and what did you learn and what can we learn? To be honest, the highlight of my time was working with my Russian cosmonauts. Um, in the evenings, you know, we would work all day long, seven to seven or whatever. And it, when I was done, I would make my dinner, which were these green bags. I'd throw them in a Ziploc bag and I'd float down to the Russian segment and have dinner with those guys. And I, we just had a good time talking about the day, talking about what was going on on Earth. They, were, they would teach me Russian language, you know, words that, you're, that you don't weren't learn in class. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we, we just had a good time down there. And I really enjoyed spending time with those guys. In fact, in my movie, One More Orbit, that I think we're going to talk about, Gennady Padalka, my crewmate, joined me for one of the segments of this world record flight that we did. And he's just a great guy, great friend of mine, the human with the most time in space. He's been in space for 879 days. Wow. Wow. Fantastic. Yeah. So so, so there was a, a one section for the Russians and one section for uh, the rest of the crew from US. Were they kind of, you know, separated? Well, there is a Russian segment, all the modules that they launched. And then there's the, we call it the US segment, but it's really the everybody else segment, US, uh, Europe, Japan, and Canada. And um, so... The Russians have their jobs that are almost all on the Russian segment. We have our jobs that's almost all on our segment. So it would be really easy to spend your days and never see each other. Uh, right. And I, when I was commander, you know, some crews are divided and other crews aren't. And I really wanted to make mine one crew. So I, I went out of my way to make sure that we spent time. I always invited them. When we would talk to the different ground control segments, sometimes the Americans talk to Houston and the Russians talk to Moscow. But I would always call Moscow and try and talk to them. Um, sometimes they wouldn't answer me <laughs> probably cause my Russian was so bad, but, um, I, I tried to make a real effort to make it one crew and, you know, so much of business is in, global. I mean, we were at Harvard business school. It's one of the most global programs anywhere. And there's very few businesses today. Um, despite, you know, the last couple of years have been crazy, but hopefully we'll get back to kind of a normal global economy. And I, that's the future. The title of your presentation, leadership lessons from space is actually a talk, you know, I've done consulting for this for the last couple of years because it's so important to work together with other cultures. And the space station is a great example of that, especially America and Russia, because everybody thinks that Russia is this big, bad arch enemy. And, you know, in Russia, they're all afraid of Americans. We're all spies and that nothing could be farther from the truth. You know, they're just normal people. I'm sure you had Russians in your Harvard class. There's always, you know, there's always a couple of guys there. So that was probably maybe the of all the things the space station's done, engineering achievements, the science experiments, medical experiments that we've done. I think the international cooperation aspect is the most important thing that the ISS has brought to the world. I think a couple of years ago, you didn't actually join the GMP class uh, from the space station as well. So yes. you, I think uh, you Skype Tino. Yeah. I don't know whether it was Skype Tino or what was the connection. So what was it like dialing know. into uh, the GMP kind of, you know, fellow GMPers there? Yeah, that was interesting because the setup that NASA has, uh, it, it's like you're doing a public affairs a interview with ABC News or CNN or whatever. There's a camera and they can see you, but you can't see them. It's not like Zoom or, what well, you know, we're, there's so many different softwares, but they're all basically the same. It's the Brady Bunch uh, thing. It's not like that in space. You can't see it. So I could hear them. And as I was talking to Vicky Good and Linda Hill, uh, two of the ladies, you know, the the, the icons of Harvard Business School, I was talking about that. And, and they said, well, we have someone else here for you. And this voice got on and said, Terry. And I thought, mom? Uh, <laughs> and it was my mom. One of the GMP students had uh, brought my mom up from Maryland. And uh, anyway, it was really cool. But I'm glad I guessed that. I would have still been in trouble had I not um, guessed that. And by the way, I just I do guest lecturing, as you know, teach the Columbia and the Challenger case. And I just did that this weekend with Stefan Tonka. But they have the most amazing Zoom. It's really yeah. incredible. It's like a professional production. They have a whole team of producers. The camera angle is changing constantly. It's really good. Um, it's, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was uh, connecting with Stefan uh, last week on, on a different topic. But uh, what they're doing and how they reinvented the whole kind yeah. of working remotely is just fascinating. Um, so Terry, um, we're going to switch to a segment where I'm going to bring up a couple of your pictures and I hopefully uh, you'll recognize them. Uh, one thing is, I don't know whether to call you an astronaut, a director, 
author because you've done so many things, right? What, what, I, what do you like to be called? Just Terry. Terry works. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Terry. So let's see how this goes. I saw 23 different hurricanes and typhoons and tropical systems. This was by far the most amazing. Um, it was massive. It was terrifying. You see the eye is so big. It was the largest ever Pacific April storm. And uh, one of the movies I helped make was called A Beautiful Planet. It's an IMAX film. The Beautiful Planet film was incredible, but there's a great scene in, in Beautiful Planet flying over my sack. And it was a terrifying hurricane, to say the least, typhoon. So this is the cupola. I haven't seen, I see these pictures all the time. That one's a little bit different, but that's the seven windowed module I installed on that first Endeavor flight. And then when I went back a few years later, I was taking a lot of pictures from there. Uh, in my mind, the earth is always up, you know, because the cupola is on the bottom of the station. So earth is that way, which is an interesting perspective shift. This is landing. So if you get your map out and look up nowhere, um, in the middle of that is where the Soyuz lands. So you can see, the, the capsule itself is upright. See, there's a guy climbing on a ladder, so the hatch is up top. Normally, it lands on its side, so that big Russian guy goes in, grabs you, and drags you out. But when it's upright, you have to crawl yourself out, and then they grab you, bring you down the ladder, and put you in a chair. Getting out of that capsule was not easy. I was sitting there. I felt fine. But as soon as I started moving, the world started spinning. I was so dizzy. I mean, I was able to do it. Um, and then... Shortly thereafter, they, you get up, you go get out of your space suit, put on a flight suit, and um, NASA puts you through all kinds of torture. You have to get down on your stomach and stand up as fast as you can, and uh, some of that stuff's pretty pretty painful. So, so what was the the time for reentry, and what what was it like? You know, coming down. Uh, you know, I, I heard the coming down was much faster, but scarier as well. In the Soyuz, yeah, because the shuttle was a nice, gentle, slow, 45-minute, you know, like one and a half Gs. But the Soyuz is a bowling ball. You're coming straight down. The Gs spike. It's probably three or four Gs. You tumble and spin a lot. <laughs> then the, as the parachute comes out in stages, every time it comes out, it snaps you, and you just spin around a couple times. And it was a crazy ride home. But it works. It's very simple. It's It's not a space shuttle, but it's very dependable. And they, knock on wood, they've had success ever going back to the 1970s. So it was, I'm glad I got to do both. It was fun doing both. And so, so how do you actually uh, aim at the target where, where you land and, and how do you control that? Well, the Soyuz is all computer. It's just, just like Boeing and SpaceX, these new capsules we have coming out, they're hundred percent computer control. There's no manual. There, there are some manual modes that you can make some inputs, but that's not, they're not designed to work that way. The computer figures out when to do the deorbit burn. You turn around, the rocket burns, and that slows you down. And it slows you down the exact amount, you know, down to the tenth of a second is how the burn is timed. Because uh, you're going five miles a second. Mm -hmm. So if you miss it by a few seconds, you, you're 20, you know, or 30 or 40 kilometers long or short. If you're short, you're coming down too steep. You can burn up. I mean, you can crush the vehicle by, by coming down too steep. And if you're too shallow, you could skip. And you don't skip off into the galaxy. You skip, and then halfway around Earth, you hit the atmosphere again. But that time, you hit it a lot steeper, and that's a lot more dangerous. And you're thousands of miles or kilometers. To, who knows where you are? You're in the middle of the Indian Ocean or something. <laughs> Thank you for sending this one. This is one of my favorite pictures. Is that Sri Lanka? Absolutely, yeah. Very cool. Yeah, I can tell because it's dark. It's a really dark island because I'm assuming there's a lot of jungle there, I would guess. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Middle, uh, middle are, are, right. Is, is this your home? This is my home. So, um, so I, uh, my, my mom is actually from south of Sri Lanka, Gaul. My right. dad is from Ratnapura, but I um, grew up and went to school in Colombo. Is that Colombo in the southwest? You can see like a, on the coast. Yeah. So this is kind of you know crooked in a in a slight different way as well. Right. Yes. Right. North. North is to the right. I think. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, you know, right? what, what's interesting is this is the first time actually I saw the Sri Lanka kind of you know view in this format. Right. If you see this little little um, little connection down to India, they, they they apparently long time ago. I'm not a good history buff either. Uh, there used to actually be a bridge that's connecting the the north part of the 
uh, the Sri Lanka to right. to uh, you know India, and apparently that's that's part of that bridge, that connection uh, connection sort of you know uh, little thread that you see there. I've never yeah. seen that in any other picture like this. You can see it's really shallow. That between Sri Lanka and India is in the bottom right, and that light yeah. colored water is just really shallow water. This is a super cool picture. <laughs> That's my crew. Yeah, the the three of us in blue flew on one Soyuz, and then we were there. The other guys went home, and then the three guys in red showed up on the next Soyuz. And so there's this constant rotation of, you know, three people on a Soyuz, three people on a Soyuz, three people on a Soyuz. SpaceX just flew four people or two people on a SpaceX, which will eventually carry four. For the last ten years, it's only been Soyuz, but soon we'll have SpaceX, and Boeing is hoping next year to launch their crew. Um, so we'll see, but uh, there, there's this. Regardless of what the vehicle is, you take to and from. Uh, there's this constant rotation of people up and down from different countries. There's me and Scott are American, Samantha's Italian, and Gena, Misha, and Anton are all Russian. So it's very international crew. Did you get to work with this team before you met them on in space? Did you go through the whole norming, storming, forming, or did you actually go through in in the space station? So your crew on your Soyuz, so me, Anton, and Samantha in the blue shirts, we got we knew each other really, really well. We did mm -hmm. lunar survival together. We did summer survival together. And there's chapters in my book about that, by the way. You know, we practiced for launch and landing. We did all of our Russian segment and space station training together. So we're, we're really good friends to, to this day, which is great. And then um, I knew Scott for 10 years in the astronaut office. But so Gena and Misha and I got to know each other, but not that well and then the, the crew before them it was the same thing like i knew them we would do stuff occasionally in in a real sense you kind of make your crew once you get to space because it's mm -hmm. you don't have a lot of time on earth when you're all together everybody's always in a different country doing training uh, because it's not like you all fly up together and all fly back again there's this crew and then there's that crew and then there's this crew and then there's that crew and the, the, you know they overlap so this one is a interesting picture i read a little bit about it but i'd love to actually hear more from your side, mm -hmm. what it was and, and why this was special. Well, th this is uh, me and Samantha practicing with our ammonia masks. So you can see ammonia cartridge if you can read backwards in those orange bags. And they're just gas masks with either smoke cartridges to filter out smoke or ammonia is a very special kind of cartridge because ammonia, NH3, is a really deadly compound. If you work in the oil and gas or chemical, there you go. Um, yeah. you'll, you know, ammonia is bad. In fact, the NASA trainers told us if you smell ammonia, you don't have to worry about working the procedure because you're going to die. <laughs> so <laughs> we ended up having an ammonia alarm, which is the coolant fluid. It's like the American radiator fluid. The Russians use glycol, but I mean, NASA uses ammonia. It was a bad day. We thought we were going to die. We thought the station was going to die. We couldn't smell any. We, we couldn't detect it in the atmosphere. So we sealed ourselves off in the Russian segment, but we thought that there was a real leak in the U S segment and you know, it was a false alarm, but it, we spent a day thinking it was going to be the real deal. And it was it was a good example of international cooperation. It was probably one of the most important moments of my mission, mm. for sure. So this, this is a great example of crisis management. So, so tell me a little bit about what, what kind of lessons um, can we pick mm. from here? Because you go through all the training, but then when, as you said, when that sort of, you know, smell comes through, what's going through your head is like, you know, <laughs> I can't even imagine what it must be like. I started flying at the Air Force Academy when I was 17 years old, um, went on to fly jets when I was 21. And the Air Force had this procedure philosophy for emergencies. It's a three-step process. And it's one of the things I talk about when I talk about business you know, consulting and how to handle crisis. It's maintain aircraft control, analyze the situation, and take appropriate action. And those three things apply to just about everything. So the first thing I would do as a shuttle pilot or a fighter pilot, if, if an emergency happened or there's a warning light that came on or I got some call, is nothing. Like the first thing, just don't do anything. Breathe through your nose. Because if you just go, ah, and flip a switch, there's a high chance you're going to flip the wrong switch. Um, so the first thing is maintain aircraft control. You also don't want to get distracted by the lights and fly your airplane into the ground while you're staring at what may be nothing. In fact, there's a very tragic and, and famous um, aircraft accident with a, an airliner in Florida flying over the Everglades and they had a basically a false alarm, some meaningless low level light. And both pilots were just staring at this thing. What is this thing? Well, how did, the, how did that come on? 
well, what are we going to do to fix it? Is that going to, this is annoying. Are we going to be able to do the next leg? And they flew the plane into the ground, into the Everglades. So that for idea of maintaining aircraft control applies to jets. It applies to spaceships. It applies to businesses too. You know, you don't want to overreact immediately. And then the second step, analyze the situation is a tough one, but you have to take this step because if you don't, you, you're not going to make the right decision. So you have to gather all the data, you know, make a fact-based decision. It's likely that depending on the level that you're of management that you're at, you may not have all the data or you may not be sure if it's real or not. You know, look at COVID, for example, back in in January, we didn't have all the data, but it, did, it didn't take a rocket scientist to know that this could be really bad. So you're probably better erring on the side of caution. You know, take take some time, get, gather experts. A lot of times, one of the things I learned at Harvard Business School, a lot of times decision making is better in a group. If you do it right, it, you can't just let everybody have a say and have it be a, you know, a disaster. You have to have a disciplined approach to it. But a lot of times, if you use your groups properly, you can come to a much better decision. And then the third step is take appropriate action. So once you make sure the airplane's flying, you're not going to hit the ground. Once you take your time to really figure out what's going on, that's when you start flipping switches and pushing buttons and you know making acquisitions or firing people or doing press releases, whatever it is you have to do in the business world. Uh, and mm-hmm. I think that three-step process is something that works really well personally and professionally. Very insightful. Thank you for that. All right, Terry, let's uh, talk about the book. That was just uh, released as well. Uh, by the way, I've ordered the copy. I'm just waiting to get my <laughs> hands on it. Tell us a little bit about the book. Yeah, so How to Astronaut is a fun book. It, it, it's a book I wish I had before I was an astronaut because I tried to just share with people all the different aspects of space. You know, some stuff that you'd expect. Uh, how do you launch on a space shuttle? How do you do medical training? How do you do rendezvous? How do you build a space station? Just normal stuff you'd expect. Other stuff is stuff you wouldn't expect. Uh, what do you do with a dead body if your crewmate dies? Or are there aliens or unexpected situations I had at NASA? So there's there's a little bit of everything. What I really wanted to do was write a book that was accessible to everybody. So it's something that men and women can enjoy. It's something that young and old, you know, you don't have to be a space nerd. It's not at all written for technical people. I, there's a lot of NASA acronyms out there and I use a lot of them and I make fun of them all. And so, you know, you don't need any special space knowledge, I hope. And the goal I had in writing it was to make people laugh and say, wow, those are the two reactions, laugh and say, wow. So I think in some ways, and I didn't plan this when I started writing it a year and a half ago, but I, what I really hope now is that it's like the antidote to all of these political hate books that are out. <laughs> wow. Fantastic. Thanks. Thanks for that. Uh, Tell us a bit about this picture. I think this is um, what I understand is your favorite picture. Well, so my mission, it ended up being 201 days. So it was supposed to be 169. We had some rockets blow up and that delayed our replacement and that delayed our return to Earth. So we got extended an extra month. So, and I ended up taking more pictures than anybody ever. There's some poor guy in in Houston who counts photos. And when I landed, they told me I took 319,000 photos. So this was the last one. I took it. I looked at the camera, you know, a little preview monitor. And I went, that's the best picture I'm ever going to take in my life. I pulled the card out, stuck it in the laptop, downloaded it. And I was done. I've literally went down to the Russian segment, put that gray Sokol spacesuit on and, and flew back to earth. Um, but this is just, uh, I love, I love the wide angle. You know, you see earth. I love the, um, the lighting in this, it was F-22, probably a thousandth of a second. So it was really dark. So the earth is just barely visible. And and that gives uh, the, the really small aperture, gives the starburst look to the sun, all those rays. So it's just really cool. I love that. I love that shot. Fantastic. So Terry, um, let's just uh, switch back to uh, Harvard time and, and you know try to uh, understand from your perspective you did the uh, the general management program mm-hmm. a couple of years ago, I believe. So so that was 2011. I did it in 2019, and the program mm-hmm. has also evolved significantly. You know, what, what made you decide to do uh, a general management program, mm-hmm. and what did you get out of that? So at that point, I had been at NASA for over a decade. Um, I had flown my first space shuttle flight, and I didn't know what I wanted to do when I grew up. And every every year, we would get these emails from the boss Hey, you know, we have these management programs if you want to do one. And a a lot of schools have these one week or two week management programs. There was like a two week course. And then there was the semester long GMP was much bigger. And honestly, I didn't want to do that because I had small kids and I 
didn't want to be gone from home. And the boss said, Hey, we think this is the best one for you. So they put me in for it. I had to do this NASA wide competition where, you know, all of NASA was competing for one slot to this GMP course. And I got it. Thank, thank God I got it. It was one of the most important things I've ever done in my life. It was certainly the best training to be a space station commander was going to Harvard business school um, because of the international aspect of it, the very global, you know, students that were there in your living groups, um, the idea of interpersonal skills being important. You know, I was a fighter pilot, just put me in charge and everything will be good. Um, and I came out of Harvard realizing that that's not true. Um, so Harvard was really, really good for my, my personal development. And I, and I love it. I can't wait to go back to Cambridge. You know, I, I go there a couple times a year as a guest lecturer and those types of things where you get away from your daily grind. You just focus on learning and making you a better you uh, is a really important, really important thing. Building, building those uh, soft skills as well as innovation. Oh, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. No, thanks for that. Okay. So, Terry, um, let me switch to uh, a little bit of tech talk as well. Okay. Um, I've, I've taken on a, a new role recently. and I'm, I'm, in fact, actually starting the new role uh, next week. And part of that is about um, looking at what we call the intelligent edge, uh, which is where we you know, look at devices, including HoloLens uh, headgear. And um, we actually released a, a short video last week about what we are using HoloLens for. Uh, and there's a quite an interesting scenario. Let me uh, play this uh, little trailer and we'll come back. Orion is the only spacecraft that can take humans into deep space, like the moon and Mars. We're just finishing that development phase, moving into production, where we'll be launching Orion about once a year. We're using mixed reality technologies to benefit our programs, requirements, and challenges so that we can produce spacecraft at lower costs with higher quality and less time. For Orion, we're using mixed reality to assemble the crew seat. When a technician puts on a HoloLens, they instantly see the work instruction instead of having to go through stacks of rectangular data, whether it's paper or another form of a screen. It understands the environment. It's anchored to the structure, and that allows us to place content within the environment. Being able to see the same design together and look through different options allows us to make those decisions more quickly. With every activity, we're seeing significant reductions in touch labor. We see increases in quality. What we found was that we could take an eight hour activity and reduce it down to 45 minutes. We see a reduction in cost. We haven't had a single error that's been documented, which is really exciting. We're partnering with Scope AR, who's using Azure Mixed Reality Services to bring all of this to life. The mixed reality allows us to move more quickly from concept and design, spanning into tests and operations, and possibly even for astronauts in space. Now, when you were up there, um, you didn't actually have a HoloLens device. You had to use the manuals to look at the checklist and so on. So, so part of the use case uh, that they were talking about is when you have a situation where your hands are engaged with either books or kind of you know equipment, and how do you actually have that mixed reality device that can overlay the data in front of you? And that's you know one of the you know pieces of devices we are working with. So so what kind of you know technologies did you have on board for particularly for training as well as sort of you know following instructions, you know checklists and so on? How did you manage them? Yeah, congrats on the new job. I saw it on LinkedIn uh, the other day. The um, when I landed, I did some development work like in the lab at NASA with uh, augmented reality glasses and. Man, I, I would have loved to have had something like that because the technology we had was basically uh, everything that you do has a procedure and the and it's in a standard format procedure, which is good because it's everything that you need is there, but it just it crushes your will to live. I mean, having to read these procedures is really painful and it's not the best way to do things. Imagine having to read a procedure, step one, and having to using words, describe what the toolbar is and describe what the little Wi-Fi thing is and describe what the thing is. And so you can imagine that 
using words to write out steps for this stuff is super painful. Um, if you were having to find a bolt, and like in this video, they're talking about the Orion fasteners, I was spent, it seems like years of my life, stuck behind some panel try, trying to figure out which wire to cut or which bolt to unloosen. And I'd have to look at it and then come out and look at my laptop and in my brain, remember it, and then go back in. Okay, is that it? No, it's, what is it? What's that one? And come out. And it was so inefficient. If I had a glass that would just circle the thing and said, cut here, I could reach in and grab it. And that would make things so much easier. So um, having a procedure when you're back behind the panel and having to go out to flip through the steps, if you could just have the steps right there where you could read the procedure while you worked. There's just so many things that could be really useful with a tool like this. Um, hopefully exactly. someday, hopefully someday, you know, NASA gets there. First 90 days in a new job, right? Uh, what right. lessons do you have for um, people like myself or others who are joining a, a new team or a new company? I think one of the best lessons I learned in my career was um, don't just bring the boss problems, um, at least bring them solutions also. Now, if you're brand new, you don't just want to make all the decisions on your own. That That's a quick way to... <laughs> Find, have, get, you know, work on your resume for your next job. So you have to, you know, talk to the boss about what's going on. But if, if, if something's wrong or, Hey, you know, the, we don't have enough power for this, uh, glasses, it's only lasting an hour and maybe the last two hours, but we could reduce the software duty cycle, or we could get this other battery or at least try and bring options so that, you know, bosses have nothing but problems all the time. And if, if there's someone that can bring them, you know, solutions that could be a really good thing now if you're brand new and they've been there for a long time they they may not take your solution but they might and and at least you're showing initiative so i think that's an important one and just be cognizant of that and you know sometimes you may just have no idea and that's that's why they're the boss and you're not but sometimes uh you can make their life a lot easier by letting them know that and if they start seeing that you're always having a solution and they're like yeah that's good do that yeah that's good do that then they'll trust you right and they'll start they'll give you more and more rope to, that you can hang yourself with. <laughs> so um, that's that's my advice. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. And and part of that is also you touched on uh, another very interesting topic dear to my heart, which is, you know, inclusively and inclusive and diversity. So, mm -hmm. you know, you, you talked about, you know, you could be in a team, you're new, you might not know everything that the others know. They have been there for a long time. And that's a quite a common scenario, even in, in your case, right? So, what, what does diversity and inclusion mean to you in the context of space and the, and the teams you had to deal with? And, and what lessons do you have there? Um, it's really the boss's job to force people to talk. And some people are just shy, but mm -hmm. they're probably smart. And so um, as a boss, you have to be perceptive that you know, a lot of us are engineers and we just don't care about people. We just want to write code. But the reality is like, if you're going to be the manager or the boss, you have to if you can see that someone's not making any input, you have to call on them and for and draw things out. Um, and you also have to not, you know, snap and bark and kill people when they say something that's not right. Because if you do that once, you're if if you don't like to hear bad news, and you see this at the highest levels of leadership in America, right? Somebody who doesn't want to hear bad news is not going to hear bad news, and that's mm -hmm. a really, really, really super dangerous place to be. At the higher up you are, and the more important you are as a boss. And so, I guess the one thing about diversity and inclusion like if i had a team and everybody said i said hey guys should we do a or b and every, i go around a a a a a by the time i got to the last person i would say all right why tell me why i should do b and i would force them to pr promote something i said i know you don't want to do it but just tell me why i should do it and Absolutely. And, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a topic where, you know, it's not one or the other. Diversity and inclusion, they have to go hand in hand. And, and, and I love this, right. you know, thing. They say uh, that diversity is about getting the mix and that inclusion is getting the mix to work, which is really what you're talking about, hmm. right? It's, it's uh, having, yeah. the, having the mix is one thing, but if you're not getting the voices heard, then you haven't really achieved it. So, yeah, fantastic, fantastic. Yeah. All right, Terry. So, Thank you once again for taking the time. Uh, this has been an amazing journey to learn heaps. We can continue to do you know, for hours, but I know uh, you've got to go. So thanks yeah. again, and um, hopefully uh, we'll uh, connect soon and wish you all the best with the movie as well as the book. Sounds good. Thank you. This is, this is really cool. Hopefully we can do something in the future. Absolutely, Terry. Take care. Okay. See you. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. 
we're trying to set a world record. It's the so fastest it's time ever to go from one place on the Earth, over both poles and back to the same point on the Earth, all in under 48 hours. Calling themselves one more orbit, their goal is to complete the fastest circumnavigation of the Earth via the North and South Poles in a business jet. And they're live streaming the whole thing.